uh, I call it hash for adaptive hashing that uh, started out as a, as a, I guess, a diversion that ended up, um, uh, I think, becoming, uh, seemed to be more generally useful. And um, the, the diversion was that uh, we were working on a, uh, a joint model of, of text and network relations that, that, that seemed to work very well for uh, data we were testing it on, but um, it's a, it was a single process algorithm, uh, a Monte Carlo uh, inference algorithm, and to run on larger data, we needed some way to, to, to do the inference uh, on a distributed uh, cluster. And in the process of trying to figure out how to do that, we came up with um, uh, this hashing methodology that, um, and, and what I'm gonna talk about here is uh, applying that same hashing methodology to a totally different type of data using a different uh, type of model. So um, I guess this sometimes happens in scientific exploration as you're trying to solve one problem and you end up solving a, a different one, so. The, the reason we thought this was more generally applicable is uh, what I'll describe as the motivating problem, and I appreciate uh, being slotted to follow uh, the Google talk on TensorFlow because I was struggling with how to describe the motivating problem, but they, I think they covered it pretty well if you sat uh, through that, that excellent talk on TensorFlow in, in that where there's just a, a really um, incredibly large amount of interesting problems that have, um, that are characterized by uh, online streaming data. And there are a lot of interesting um, models, uh, you know, supervised or unsupervised, uh, that, that work well in batch mode, but uh, not so well in streaming mode. So that's the, I guess, the general motivation. Um, and I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, server logs in particular, and uh, I don't think a knowledge of those are is really required to understand this, but I'll try to explain it a little bit. Um, but some of the characteristics of, the, of this problem, I think are characteristics in general, in that um, we don't know in advance how many groups or clusters are in our data. And the data is arriving so fast that we need to be able to run actually in streaming mode to keep up, not in a, like a hard real time, like a, like a, you know, a, a mechanized way, but, but we need to be not falling behind the data. And um, as I mentioned that often, you know, traditional batch modes of operation don't apply in that you can't just accumulate data for a day and process and then hope to keep up. You have to be in some kind of streaming mode. And I, and I kind of have to agree with the last speaker that, that these aren't really streaming or online algorithms per se. You're really trying to figure out some way to do a mini batch. Um, and, and I'll get to that in a little bit more detail. So, uh, so examples are, and at least the, the data that I've worked with are, uh, you know, Internet things, of Things logs or uh, server performance, um, security logs. Uh, I'm going to focus specifically on, on web server access logs. So, you know, when you go to um, like, a, like a retail site or you're trying to book some travel and it's this, the access log and, and the, the, uh, the rate of, act of, of requests to these logs can be astonishing. It could be, you know, 10,000 requests per second or even higher. So that's the, I guess, the motivating example here. So the, if you aren't familiar with it, whenever you go to a, whenever I, I have a new intern or a student at our um, research lab, I always turn on a, a network uh, monitoring application like Wireshark or um, uh, um, T-Shark, something like that, and show them what happens when you, when you just go to a website for the first time and there's just a huge amount of data that goes back and forth between your browser and a server. But the, at the high level, uh, an access log looks something like this. This is sort of the, an old, old, older style of access log. Um, I'll get to the kind of logs that we, we work with now in just a minute, but this doesn't outline, um, can provide a little bit more of a, of a motivation, but you know, in general, there's, there's just a lot of streaming data that we wanna do a first pass at, I guess, unsupervised learning, some way to um, structure this for our downstream processing. And um, I had Mapr uh, MapReduce in the title. How many people have actually coded a MapReduce um, task in here? 
couple, most. Okay, I'll probably have a little example. I'll skip over that maybe. Um, so uh, a lambda architecture is a, um, I guess a, a first pass at a streaming version of MapReduce. It's really a, a, a mini batch version, and there's already, um, I think the flavor of the last talk was that the the tooling or frameworks uh, for distributed uh, computing are are really moving very fast, which is exciting. It's great to be able to leverage open source, but it's also kind of hard to keep up. There's already um, several next steps on top of Lambda architecture, but that's the model I'm going to refer to here. And I think the the ideas are applicable. Um, you want to, doing distributed architecture, you want to code in a functional way. Um, and so I think the, I guess the, the key words would be, you want a key value framework. And I'll explain that in a little more detail. And, and I'm going to give a little background on, on uh, locality sensitive hashing. Again, trying to, the idea of standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say, in, in development. Uh, there's, a, there's some great tools like uh, Lambda Architecture and, and LSH, and we want to build on that to, to apply sort of a generic model-based approach to doing this uh, front-end unsupervised learning. And I'll give a couple details about uh, both static and dynamic ways of doing this. Dynamic being that we can adapt um, to the data, and then uh, I'll show some results with the web server log processing. So this is what a more uh, modern web server log looks like. Um, it actually ran off the end of the page. There's about 20 different fields um, that are, are logged when you browse to a website, and um, some of these are more or less interesting. Uh, I don't know if I can, there we go. So, you know, there's like a time and a, um, uh, this, this user ID may or may not be related to a cookie that is set when you go to the site. Um, this is your, you know, source IP for your computer and the, um, the desti uh, actually the, this would be the source IP. Anyway, uh, there's a, a user agent. Let me just skip ahead to that. Those are the ones we're interested in for this toy example. Um, I'll walk you through. So, kind of grouped a couple of these that we're going to focus on uh, are, you know, uh, identifiers for, for the visitor of a website. Uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with the IP address of your computer. A uh, user agent may or may not be. That's um, uh, what's encoded in the user agent is really uh, like your operating system in your browser and then maybe some I didn't edit this right, the like attachments that you've installed in your browser. Um, if you've uh, accepted cookies, or especially if you've logged into that site before, um, that cookie will be better attached to you and might actually follow you around to different systems. Um, and uh, then this, the, the, the site you're going to, the, the request you made, and then return codes. So this is the, I guess the data we'll be working with uh, throughout the the short talk here. And again, you know, the, the rate of events here is, you know, this is for like a moderate retail site would be 10,000 of these uh, requests per second, sometimes more. And just to, you know, review, this is coming in streaming. And uh, the, so the very first pass we want to do um, if we're, you know, the company is we want to sort of group all these together by, by visitor, um, whether or not there is a, a cookie or identifier associated with that. Um, and in particular, um, there's a lot of bot activity on, uh, uh, for, for visitors, and, and bots will be spread out pretty widely across IP space, and might even be trying to not be detected as such. Um, so that makes this, this grouping of activity much harder. And that sort of grouping across uh, attributes uh, makes this a hierarchical problem. And you know, I guess I'm focusing on server logs here, and hope that you can see that this kind of abstraction of this problem relates to other types of data processing, uh, where you're looking for similarity in attribute space and a hierarchy. Um, so I got a lot of hands when I asked about doing, uh, actually working with MapReduce before, so I'll just go through this very quickly, but this is a very, if you look up, MapReduce online, you'll see this example. So I think everyone is familiar with this, but just to hit the relevant points for this, the, when you're coding an algorithm in MapReduce, and really for any distributed system, you, 
want to have, um, you want to be able to distribute your input across the calculation nodes, um, and you don't want to have looping. So uh, a way to think of that is that you want to uh, identify uh, key value pairs uh, to iterate your process, to um, distribute your processing. So in this case, it's, it's trivial. The, the key for your words that you're counting are identical or equivalent to the words, and the count is just each time they're seen, and since you're distributing all the words, the count is just one. So um, it's, it's a trivial example. That's why it's the, I guess, the training one. So um, when we want to do something more complicated, our, our challenge is to figure out what should that key be when we're distributing our data across the nodes. So that works great if you're, if like say the word count example, you have a bunch of documents and you're trying to count the words in a single batch, but what about if you're getting your documents in a streaming fashion? Um, how would you do that? So you wouldn't want to have to recalculate your entire corpus every time. Um, you could, and, and you can, I won't give a lecture on the Lambda architecture, but uh, one thing, one way to do it would be to take many batches, so we'd accumulate a certain amount of data, say, you know, 10 minutes or however much would be a, and this is part of, you know, engineering these kinds of systems, but you would accumulate a certain amount of data and you would do, uh, say, the word count on that mini batch, but then you have the data you've already accumulated. And so there's a couple different strategies for doing that. Um, the Lambda architecture basically is a, a way of doing um, mini batches and then uh, doing a slower cycle of full batches to reconcile the mini batches with your, um, with the, the data that you've been accumulating through the mini batches. So you could, uh, there's a couple different ways to do this and it depends on your, your overall strategy. You could, through each mini batch, you could uh, accumulate the total you've already received uh, for each key, which in that case would be your words, or you could wait and do that on some other time scale like you know, hours or days or weeks, depending on how often you need that, um, that total um, reset. So word count is a really almost silly example for something more interesting like, uh, say, clustering, what we're doing with this um, web log data. Um, you may have, you may want to have a, a model of what your, of your, of your clustering. So, um, the, what I have here at the bottom here is that the, I guess to, to do the next level of sophistication, you, you want to think of your, of the key as representing a state or a factor. So, um, I had a better way of saying this, I <laughs> left my mind, sorry. So the, um, the way you want to accumulate your data in a Lambda architecture is to, is to map each of your data elements as, um, as um, your embedding space, to, to use the vernacular of the, of the talks from earlier today. So, so I'm gonna actually skip one slide and come back to it. So in the, the trivial example, where we make this um, web log problem very similar to word count, if we have something like a, like a cookie, then we can treat this just like word count, where our cookie is, is gonna be the same as our key. Our embedding is equivalent to um, an actual uh, subset of our fields. And, um, and so this will be very fast. And each, each data element that comes in in the mini batch, we can just associate it immediately with that, that hash uh, or, or cookie, and, um, and we'll get all of our data grouped together by, um, by that cookie. However, um, many uh, visitors to a website won't, won't use cookies or they'll reset them, and there's all kinds of unusual things that happen when you're running a website. People will reuse cookies, um, things like that, so that, that shouldn't. So we want something, and again, it's not hierarchical, so if you have, say, a bot um, using something simplistic like this doesn't allow you to uh, do any kind of hierarchical association. So we actually want to do something more complicated. We want a, uh, uh, an embedding that we can use like a distance metric. So uh, I mentioned LSH. 
Uh, if you aren't familiar with LSH, this is a quick overview. Um, it's uh, um, predicated on the Jacquard similarity between two, um, between two elements in your data set. And um, so our approach is that we want to define an attribute subset for each of our data elements and then define a function such that the um, distance between uh, the, the function is our hash. The distance between the, the hash of, of two elements is minimized when they're from the same visitor uh, or a similar visitor. And then we can use that to map uh, um, each of the data elements to, to a hash. So um, when I started this last fall, I was writing all my code in PySpark, and about the same time, at one of the Spark conferences in the Bay Area, um, Uber uh, actually announced that they were going to release the, I guess, the a pretty thorough implementation of these sort of uh, the core LSH hash functions, which are uh, cosine similarity, uh, min hash, and I think sim hash, uh, for release in the new Spark ML uh, library. I'm not sure if that's come out yet, but it would be in like a pre-release. It's probably come out by now. So they're, Uber's using this for determining uh, ride similarity. So if they have a bunch of people uh, wanting to do ride share. They can determine how similar two different um, like spline splines are in the roadway by the, this type of an algorithm. So, um, but this is just one step of of, uh, of um, this this method of using uh, approximate ha or uh, adaptive hashing. So. So using something like LSH for this uh, web log data, instead of having to rely on a cookie, um, you can use another attribute subset, like say IP address and user agent, and then you, um, you can, given a hash, you can define a distance metric that is, and I was using um, an inner product, and, and that's gonna be very similar to using a cookie uh, if that's there, however, because it's a distance metric, you can then get a, a hierarchical um, uh, clustering. Um, finally, I'm sure I have my time. Uh, finally, for the, the the thing I really wanted to get out of this, which was uh, an actual adaptive hash, um, we could take one additional step and uh, use the a priori structure of the data in, um, so looking at these two fields we're using, IP address and user agent, these aren't just like random data um, fields. There's, there's actually structure in here. So the, um, and this is getting a little more into the, the, the I guess the domain expertise, and that's another thing I appreciate in the last talk, which is that it's very hard to get away from subject matter experts in designing our learning models. So this is one area where you'd want to apply that in this particular model, is that the defining the weights. So for instance, uh, there's, there's two weights that we, we worked with. One was an a priori weight, where the, um, you could define a sort of a, a slightly informed prior on how the, the probability of seeing uh, the, um, uh, the octet structure of the IP address. You could do the same thing for user agent. I didn't really describe it in here because it's more complicated. Um, but, but the relative probabilities of different operating systems and browsers within those operating systems. Um, and then you can use that weight to, to improve your distance metric. Um, if you had enough data over time, you could derive those empirically. And this is where that, that longer batch cycle in the Lambda architecture comes into play, that you can, you can then improve those weights and um, you know, periodically, whatever, it's an hour or a week, um, reset those weights and improve your um, your clustering, and this makes the, the the hashing be both adaptive and hierarchical. So, ran this on some uh, not able to say who the, the data is from, but it's from a I guess a major online retail company. Uh, they're using AWS hosting, so the the records are. If you're familiar with this, it's standard AWS uh, S3 web server logs. So if you're using something like the simple equivalency um, hashing, it's uh, relatively trivial to associate 
uh, the data it, uh, where some, some of these fields match, and that, that seems obvious, but the point is, is that you're doing this in a distributed infrastructure. So you're doing this at, at the line speed of the data. When, you, uh, when we included the, um, the weighting version of the hashing, we're able to automatically detect things like standard bots, like Googlebot and the other, and this was a relatively limited data, data set, um, so we didn't dig into, I guess, the more esoteric activity uh, on these public websites, but the, the standard sort of uh, more distributed activity of bots just really jumped out, and we were able to, again, this was uh, without any other information other than the sort of a priori structure of the, um, those fields, the, the um, Lambda architecture was automatically grouping this, again, in a hierarchical way. Um, I'll skip through that. So the initial data set was 146,000 elements, and that was just for a few seconds. Um, and we stress test up to 102 million elements. Um, the the mini-batch computation stayed relatively constant, even as the number of um, clusters increased. Had a different, uh, and again, uh, sorry, both of these were on uh, a, a, a four, a set of a four AWS, um, uh, R4 by four, X large. Uh, this was done exactly on this system. So each of them were 16 core systems. Um, this was done on a similar setup. It was a proprietary um, build, but that was uh, similar in construction to this, slightly more RAM per uh, system. Um, this was a slightly older implementation, but it was a, it was a similar uh, setup. Uh, and the, the processed about a, a billion, slightly more than a billion data elements. Um, and these batches were much more coarse. Um, and there's a slight increase in the, uh, the time per batch um, due to, we think, uh, the number of clusters increasing over time. But we haven't invest investigated that. Uh, and also did not reduce the batch time down on that, which might help with that scaling. Um, so conclusion, um, the, again, this was like a side project to try and figure out a way to do distributed computation for uh, actually Bayesian models, um, but um, uh, used uh, existing frameworks for both streaming processing and uh, hashing uh, for, for doing that and developed sort of a general purpose way of doing adaptive uh, hashing and apply that to a totally different problem, which is uh, uh, web log, uh, hierarchical clustering. And uh, but I coded this in PySpark. Um, there, as we mentioned earlier, in at least one of the earlier talks, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, continual improvement in the tooling. And um, Apache Flink, for those of you who aren't aware of it, is a is a explicitly for streaming uh, and stateful processing. And so we're hoping to open source uh, this tool set in that sometime this fall. So look for that. And thank you.